Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Donnelly, Manager of Webinars for Independent Banker Magazine. And on behalf of ICBA and Independent Banker Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You may ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck by clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources. You'll find that on the left side of your screen. And know that you can download those right from the platform without being disconnected from the webinar. Today's webinar, Cybersecurity for Community Banks, is sponsored by Cypher, a cybersecurity company that offers a variety of solutions for community banks and other companies in the financial services industry. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to your first speaker for today, Bill Bowman, Director of Marketing for North America. Bill, you now have the floor. Thanks, Janine. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today as we uh, discuss cybersecurity for community banks. We're going to discuss some of the, the challenges out there and what organizations can do to, to confront them in order to stay safe. So my name is Bill Bowman. I'm the Director of Marketing for Cypher in North America. Uh, my colleague, David Rickard, is, is also going to be presenting. He'll be doing the, the heavy lifting of the session as we, we talk about some of the details of cybersecurity for community banks. So just to set the stage, we're going to look at the, the threat landscape that's out there for organizations, including organizations in finance. So companies in finance are 300 times more likely to be targeted than other industries, according to a survey by Boston Consulting Group. So common threats, companies in finance are phishing, ransomware, insider threats, malware, and data breaches. So data breaches is a, is a topic that David's going to go into in some detail because it is such, such a, a big issue for, with cybersecurity. And as we look at community banks in particular, you know, community banks might not have the same amount of internal resources as larger banks or, or larger financial institutions. So the threats out there, the resources may or may not be available. So we're going to look at what can be done to stay safe. So just to set the stage a little bit about who Cypher is briefly. Cypher is the cybersecurity division of Crossagur, which is a full, full security provider of man guards, cash, alarms. And we focus on the cybersecurity element of, of security. So we have over 300 subject matter experts around the world in 15 countries. Uh, we have six security operation centers. Um, I'm calling in from our, our operation center in Miami. We have over 1,000 clients. And really, as Janine mentioned, we do it all when it comes to cybersecurity. So we have 24-7 monitoring services that companies can employ. So we monitor their environments around the clock. We can provide consulting services and, and workshops to, to give companies, you know, a really good baseline and a head start as to how they can stay secure. So we, do, we really do it all. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to David, and he'll discuss strategies for cybersecurity operations. Dave? Thank you, Bill. Uh, again, my name is Dave Rickard. I'm CTO of North America for Cypher Security. I've been with Cypher for four years now. Um, uh, my background uh, goes back quite a ways, really. I've been a database programmer. I've been a database administrator. I've been a network engineer and a Unix engineer, a uh, web developer, and so on and so forth. Now, all this harkens back uh, to the days when cybersecurity didn't really exist. In fact, uh, as late as the late 90s, um, people didn't want to put up those newfangled things called firewalls because they would put a hit on their network throughput of between 30 and 40 percent, actually, and that's still true, right? But it's a different age now. Uh, we have to pay attention to cybersecurity um, because otherwise it costs us a lot of money 
Now, the threat landscape we've been seeing as of late, uh, through 2020 at least, uh, has been highlighted by breaches of solar winds. Everybody heard of the solar winds breach. Now, what happened with that one is <clears throat> threat actors compromised a DLL, a, a dynamic link library. That's just one small part of the solar winds distribution. Everybody who then updated solar winds got that DLL, and what that turned into is a backdoor to download yet more malware to them. Now, the primary use for that was to exfiltrate or uh, steal uh, personally identifiable information, PII. Uh, other uh, breaches that have happened uh, were to Twitter. Uh, they got credentials through phone spear phishing and compromised a lot of celebrity accounts. Uh, Marriott and MGM Resorts um, lost a combined 15 million records. Uh, some of this was due to acquisition. One outfit uh, acquired another that didn't have quite as mature of a security program. And even Discovery, as we'll get into here in a few minutes, even Discovery that the breach had occurred was a problem for them. Uh, Zoom, of course, everybody's working from home, and Zoom exploits, I think, are are very familiar. We've all heard it on the evening news, really. Uh, Finastra is a financial software solutions uh, company. They got hit by ransomware and took them out of business for two or three days, actually. The Greek banking system uh, got compromised by travel agencies that uh, interacted with them uh, that led to the requirement of reissuing 15,000 cards. All of these cost money for these companies that got breached because all of them represent money to the threat actors. This is the primary motivation for data breaches occurring in the first place. In fact, in 2020, only 11% of the breaches that happened were initiated by nation states. Um, what do they want with millions of records of PII? Of course, uh, that can be left open to wide speculation, really. Uh, primarily, the purpose in these breaches occurring is to steal information, mostly PII, 83% of the time, in fact, um, and monetize that. Now, what do we do about it? The first thing we need to realize is that it's human nature to have a prevention bias. Prevention, of course, being the act of stopping something from happening, bias being a partiality for a perspective or position based on belief rather than fact. And I can testify to this as part of my own human nature. Uh, I've been a security guy for so long, my primary objective has for a very long time been to uh, prohibit and prevent the behavior that I hate, and that is the behavior that is going to lead to uh, malware getting downloaded, for instance. Uh, phishing is a huge attack vector, the primary one that you need to look out for, in fact. Now, um, this is natural. As parents, we want to protect our children. As citizens, we want to protect our rights and possessions. And as security pract practitioners, we naturally want to have all the preventative measures we can afford at our disposal in order to avoid loss. Preservation of business value is the purpose of cybersecurity efforts. Um, and so let us proceed on to our next slide. The thing is, is that the more uh, that you spend on preventative measures, the less bang for the buck you get. Uh, of course, everybody needs a firewall, and I think everybody knows that. Now, firewalls keep track of the network connection and the session, right? These, uh, these correspond to the OSI network layer model of to layers three and five. There are seven layers altogether. IPS comes in and plays a similar role, <clears throat> but dealing on layer seven. This is the application layer. This involves inspection of packets for the data they contain uh, and evaluating that based on what application that data is for. Uh, we know that we need antivirus. In fact, it's a really, really good idea to um, look into next generation endpoint protection that can detect, detect uh, zero day attacks. Uh, some of these would be CrowdStrike or Carbon Black or FireEye HX or a variety of other ones. Now, at that point, though, the actual amount of risk that you reduce doesn't necessarily correspond with the amount of money that you're spending. Data loss prevention might be a regulatory requirement uh, in 
fact, uh, use of a security incident and event management system may be required of you because you have PCI requirements, 24 by 7 monitoring and file integrity monitoring is required by PCI. Um, network access control is a very nice thing to have. What it does is it qualifies uh, what machine attributes must be present in order to let them onto your network, whether it's uh, locally plugging in or connecting over VPN remotely. It's nice to have. Uh, it's a uh, tremendous administrative overhead, but still nice to have. And digital rights management, likewise, this is in the interest of protecting intellectual property. We want to protect against who can print it. We want to protect against who can edit it, uh, who can change it. Uh, this starts to play into the three pillars of security. That's confidentiality. We want to make sure that uh, sensitive information doesn't get out beyond those authorized to see it. Integrity. We want to make sure that what people are looking at is what they think it is. It's the website they intended to click through to. It's the document that's authoritative that they thought they were looking at. Integrity is huge. And availability. We want to make sure that systems that uh, handle traffic and, and process all of this information and give access to it uh, are available. Uh, if your e-commerce site is down, for instance, you're losing money. So at some point, the effectiveness of preventative spend declines. Uh, computing the return on investment for preventative measures will illustrate this, and we'll cover a little bit of that today. In fact, uh, computing the return on investment ROI for security initiatives is a big deal. It's a challenge for everyone who first approaches it, but there are concrete ways to quantify what a return on investment for a cybersecurity initiative can be. Um, on to the next slide, then. It's likewise, just like prevention, having a prevention bias is, is a natural part of being a human being, we love to think about things in groups of three. Um, in triads, like the three wise men, or the three musketeers, or the three stooges. Just uh, imagine all of the different things that uh, we know of that are grouped in triads. Now, these do correspond with uh, larger security frameworks, such as the National Institute for Standard and Technologies cybersecurity framework that identifies five control areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. But we can simplify that a little bit to just three areas of prevention, have a firewall, have an IPS, have endpoint protection, DLP, um, well, let's talk about it. Um, and also detection. Now, the prevention bias tends to influence us to not spend money on detection and response, and that is at the suffering of our security programs. Uh, detection would be in terms of we're doing 24 by 7 monitoring or some kind of monitoring of all of our security controls. We automate that as much as possible, and we use a SIM, that's a security incident and event management platform, in order to correlate all the different logs together. Something that we see on a firewall, that we see a correlated event on an IPS, and then we also see it on an endpoint. Now, the fidelity of that event is very high. It's raised quite a bit, and we have high confidence that it's a true positive that requires action. Detection is a critically important step. And then response. If we can detect it, but we don't respond to contain it and then neutralize it and then learn from uh, lessons that, that uh, were taught to us by this event uh, to modify our procedures, our incident response playbook, um, and track metrics by category and priority and severity and so on and so forth so that we know what our threat landscape is. Uh, this is the role of response, for sure. And these are things that we find uh, across our client base. Uh, people tend to uh, give a short shrift to. They tend to want to spend money on preventative measures and not as much on operational measures. Now, one way to measure what um, the cost can potentially be and even the probability that the cost will be incurred is an annual report that the Ponymon Institute comes up with. They do it uh, commissioned by IBM. They've been doing it every year for 14 years. Uh, so we're going to look at some facts and figures from the Ponymon Institute annual breach cost report in terms of what are the average total breach costs 
uh, globally in the U.S. by different industry verticals. What is a be breach probability? We'll talk about how likely are you to be breached and incur a, a breach cost. Uh, what are some of the root causes that we see in uh, reported breaches that uh, result in these kinds of costs? We're going to talk about per capita costs because this is a way that Ponymon likes to be able to qualify and quantify just how they come up with these figures. Per capita refers to the loss of a single data record. One single data record on average uh, in the United States in 2020 cost $150. So if you had a breach of 10,000 records, that's a $1.5 million uh, breach cost. If you lost a million records, we're talking about 185 million records, that would be classified as a mega breach. That's along the order of Equifax uh, that happened a couple of years ago right here in Atlanta. And we'll talk about ways to reduce a breach cost exposure. Now, the thing is that a global average breach cost has stayed kind of flat for the last five years. In 2016, it was $4 million, a solid $4 million average globally uh, in breach costs that were reported. And then it dipped. In 2017, came back up and came back up some more in 2018 and 2019. And in 2020, it dipped a little bit. But basically, we're still at a nearly $4 million average costs. Now, um, again, these figures are based on a data loss equivalent of 10,000 records of data comprised of PII, PCI, and PHI data and intellectual property, but again, 83% of data loss was PII. Uh, the total breach costs in the last five years, you know, they initially declined, now they're back near to 2016's high of $4 million. That's a global, global average, and it's across all verticals. In the healthcare sector, for instance, that is the most expensive one. Uh, their breach cost was $7.13 million on average. In the financial sector, the global average is $5.85 million, more than the $4 million across the board across the board uh, uh, averages. Now, there are some things which can actually make it cost a lot more than that. These are averages, of course. Uh, we want to talk about mean time to detect, or MTTD. Mean time to detect refers to the length of time it takes a company to realize that they have been breached. And the average in 2020 was 209 days. 209 days is a long time for a breach to be active before somebody realizes that it's there and it's get more evidence that we have a preventive, preventative bias um, that uh, gives it short changes our efforts in terms of detection and response. Um, the total for identif uh, identification and containment together was 279 days. Now, on average, a breach life cycle like that that is under 200 days costs $1.2 million less. You still suffer a breach cost, you just don't suffer as much of a breach cost. A lack of detection and responsibilities can cost you a lot of money. And that is why we evangelize on the importance of detection and response. We can break out the breach cost by components and we can see that by and large lost business has been pretty flat. Uh, we will have a uh, lost business due to a uh, loss of reputation among our clientele. Uh, they'll just move their business someplace else if they're afraid that their data is going to be exposed and breached. Uh, it uh, accounts for 35% uh, or so of breach costs. We also have to figure in post-breach response. These are containment and remediation efforts um, and processes to help customers affected by the breach, reparations and fines due to regulatory failures. For instance, if uh, you're doing business in Europe and uh, the PII lost in a data breach to your company uh, uh, comes under GDPR scrutiny, this is the general data protection regulation uh, that went into effect three years ago. Um, the fines for those can be anywhere from 20 million euro to 4% of your global revenue, whichever is greater. The highest one so far has been for British Airways last year, 
that was something like three hundred and twenty three million dollars. Um, so there there are regulatory uh, fines that need to be taken into account. Um, notifications can uh, also play into um, the uh, uh, total breach cost in terms of how do we handle press releases in a public way for these. Um, do we have a press office? Do we have a PR office? Communications with individuals affected by the breach is necessary. And roles and responsibilities should be established to control interactions uh, with the media in that case. And uh, detection and escalation are activities that enable the company to realize that the breach has occurred. 24 by 7 monitoring and escalations as a program is very important. And uh, staffing for it is pretty difficult to do. Uh, and it costs a lot of money. So that's why MSSPs like Cypher exist. We fill that void and we do so very affordably. Uh, but uh, to not only detect those on a 24 by 7 basis and to notify appropriate personnel in a preconceived escalation process, this forms an incident response playbook. All of the actors on the good guys side uh, know exactly what they're going to do based on category and type of event. Um, 24 by 7 monitoring is critical for these activities and reduce the mean time to identify the MTTI of a breach to hours, uh, if not even just minutes. In fact, containment of a malware incident uh, across our client base is typically almost instantaneous. Um, and again, overall, MTTI in 2020 was 209 days, which can more than double the breach cost uh, that you're exposing yourselves to. Now, the breach probability trend has also gone up. Um, in 2020, in Ponymon's report, they didn't track this statistic, but to me it's always been one of the most fascinating ones because, <clears throat> because everyone has heard uh, their CFO say, well, you know, cybersecurity, that sounds kind of like insurance to me, and what's the likelihood that we're going to get breached we never have so far? The fact is, is that probably people just aren't aware that they've been breached so far. Um, and this actually quantifies exactly what the probability would be. There's a 30% a chance that uh, your company will incur a breach cost equivalent to the loss of 10,000 records. That's back to the per capita cost that we were talking to. Um, on average, globally, each record across all verticals uh, were uh, $150 per record. And so there's a 30% chance that people will be breached in the next 24 months uh, at a cost of $1.5 million. It's a little higher for the financial industry. The per capita cost for that is more like $185. So there's a $1.85 million exposure there in terms of risk. Now, what's the difference between cybersecurity and cyber insurance? The insurance will... Uh, compensate you for losses that you incur, that you can qualify exactly and quantify them and, and uh, report them to the insurer. Um, cybersecurity, on the other hand, strives to prevent the loss from happening at all. And uh, that greatly reduces risk to reputation and churn and turnover of customers, which is a major factor in what it costs companies when they get breached. Now we can see that the breach probability decreases as the number of records increases. Of course, in the financial uh, sector, if you lost a million records, then you're looking at a mega breach sized $185 million potential breach cost. But that's down around a percent probability. The one and a half million or $1.85 million uh, breach cost probability of 30% um, is more significant. And there are a variety of reasons and ways that that can happen. The root cause isn't, I'm sorry, was someone going to say something? I heard a breath. I guess not. It might have been my own microphone. Um, malicious or criminal attacks are not the only cause of breaches. Uh, systems can fail. Uh, we can have system glitches. We can have human error. Uh, calling back to the three pillars of security, those being 
confidentiality, integrity, and availability. System glitches and human error can take out availability, and they do a little less than half of the time. 53% uh, overall, 52 or 53% of attacks in 2020 were conducted by uh, malicious threat actors, and their goal 83% of the time was to get PII and be able to monetize that. Money is the reason why. Once again, nation-state activities were only 11% of breaches in 2020. Um, so while incidents of malicious or criminal attack has steadily risen over the years, human error has decreased or stayed the same, and so has system glitch, of course. Threat actor activities result in higher breach costs than the other two categories. And so... They rep uh, malicious activity represents 52% of the breaches that happen, but they cost more. Uh, they affect the average cost of approximately $4 million in 2020. Uh, it influences that number up, of course. Now, per capita costs can be broken out by industry vertical, and also by the type of information that is targeted. Uh, customer PII, of course, on average across all verticals on a global scale is $150 per single record lost, with a 30% chance, again, of 10,000 of those records being lost over the next uh, 24 months. Other corporate data, uh, intellectual property, we can see that it declines slightly, not a great deal, but it does decline slightly on a per record basis. Uh, anonymized customer data can also be monetized by threat actors and employee PII comes into play, especially depending on uh, what vertical you're in. Uh, employee PII for financial uh, institutions and medical concerns is a big target. Now the trend, and this starts to get interesting to me personally, the trend per capita has been in decline uh, for the last five years. Um, the health verticals uh, per capita cost has gone up. Finance has stayed about flat. Everybody else, every other vertical has gone down. And yet the, um, <clears throat> the, the average breach cost across the board has gone up. What this tells us is that breaches are happening more often, that the sizes of the breaches are increasing. And so um, I think that everybody is probably aware of this just from following the news anyway, but it's interesting to me that financial data like this would bear it out. Uh, it's very interesting to note that uh, the health verticals per capita cost is steadily risen. And most others uh, show only modest increases or declines. Uh, the past four year, years, in fact, show a 27% decline in per capita rates overall. But at the same time, again, total breach costs and malicious activities have steadily increased. And from this, we can deduce, of course, that given the per capita costs have mostly declined over the past five years, total breach costs have stayed relatively flat, indicating the size of the breaches are growing and the breaches are becoming more and more common. Now this gives rise to what can we do to try to contain breach costs? What can be a positive and negative impact on the probabilities and the costs that we'll incur if and when a breach occurs? <clears throat> We can see at the top of this list that incident response testing on average has saved almost $300,000 in breach costs for people who are testing their IR teams. This might be bringing in a red team, an attacking team is the red team, a blue team, they're the protecting team, or purple teams. It's a combination of both of those. And they do tabletop exercises, they simulate an attack, and they evaluate their response to it. Uh, carrying out those kinds of activities can save you $300,000 uh, in an average breach cost. Business continuity planning is a huge part of this because uh, any unexpected event that can cause an outage availability in our uh, uh, security pillars again, uh, any unexpected event that can take out functionality uh, needs to be accounted for in business continuity planning. What is the maximum tolerable downtime we can possibly um, possibly incur? 
beyond which the costs of that downtime are just untenable for us. We don't want to do it. Well, what that does is it leads us to devise systems and process and procedure and policy that will enable us to make sure that systems that go down will come back up within that maximum tolerable downtime frame of, of reference. And uh, of course, then we have recovery time objectives. We have recovery point objectives. How much data will we tolerate being lost as part of this uh, uh, system loss and, and recovery uh, activity? Uh, forming an instant response team. And this gets a little tough to do because finding the talent, first of all, is is a challenge in many, many geos. Um, totally junior uh, analyst levels might not be appropriate for your business to have nothing but those. But formation of the IR team is a critical part in saving some money on the breach costs that you have. And it's why, again, uh, MSSPs like Cypher exist. We have that expertise. We are ready to go. We're doing it for thousands of customers already. Having an AI platform uh, saves a lot of money. And this is largely wrapped around uh, SIM activities, security incident and event management activities. Um, they do baselining of user behavior. And when they see something outside of that baseline, they'll alert on it and get ahead of the curve, cut down that mean time to identify and save money on the breach cost. Red team testing, that's like incident response testing. Employee training is a big deal. A lot of people are doing phishing simulation campaigns now. Uh, to where they'll hire a company, such as Cypher uh, or others, many others, uh, to craft phishing emails and then send them to selected users or their entire employee base um, to see who will click the link, who will open the attachment, uh, who will put their credentials into a window that pops up. Um, when they do so, a short training pops up in a browser window, says, you've been fished, but it's okay. We were hired by your company to do this. Here are some things to look for in phishing emails. Um, gamifying those activities. In fact, when you gamify it in that way and you have a user walk by you and say, ah, I saw that you tried to fool me again today with those emails, Dave, but I didn't fall for it and you didn't send one, uh, then you know that your training is working. Of course, training in security policy and acceptable use policy and things like that should be refreshed, uh, not only on onboarding, but on an annual basis and have your users agree in an electronic signature way uh, to abide by the policy. Uh, use of encryption of the crown jewels, which is the data, uh, will make it more difficult for threat actors to be able to use it. Uh, security analytics, uh, such as reporting of metrics, will tell you what your threat landscape is and what your security roadmap should be. Uh, the sharing of threat intelligence will save you money. Uh, these come from vendors. They also come from R&D outfits like us uh, that are continually monitoring what's going on in the dark web and the threat actor communities, uh, as well as across all the thousands of clients that we're monitoring events for. Uh, we know what's going on in the world, and uh, this defines what the threat landscape is, and it constantly uh, evolves. How involved is the board? Um, and we'll get into things like that. Now, there are so also are some things that can actually increase uh, your breach costs, like having a remote workforce, and we've all been doing that the last year or so, right? Work from home uh, exposes your environment to your employees' home networks um, and the devices that are on them. If a breach occurs on somebody's home network, the threat actor will know which node on your home network has the VPN connection into uh, your corporate environment and uh, will act accordingly. Uh, how many ring doorbells and security cameras do you have? Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, are we non-compliant and we know it with GDPR or PCI or so on? Uh, if we're skating uh, regulatory requirements, it's going to cost us more in terms of breach cost if and when that happens again. Cloud migration is playing a part in this because while it's been well underway, 
for the last six or eight or even more years. Uh, it's been called different things than cloud. Uh, it, once upon a time, it was called an ASP. Uh, that goes back quite a ways. But the idea has been there for a while. And there are security uh actions which must be taken to protect those things, having the expertise to know what those are, uh, what are security protections in AWS that you can uh, deploy. Uh, it's a knowledge thing. So all the breach cost information can be summarized that uh, while we saw a significant drop in costs in 2017, we've risen back up again and we're back up to a $4 million average breach cost level. Uh, breach probability has steadily increased uh, to a 2019 level of 29.6%. We're over 30% now. Uh, in the next 24 months, that would be for the financial sector, a breach cost risk of $1.85 million. Uh, it helps to set a cyber budget. You know, let's spend a lot less than we anticipate that we're, we could lose if we were breached, but let's protect our investment. Um, uh, compared to human error and system glitch, malicious or criminal attacks have increased steadily and significantly over the past six years. In fact, they've risen by about 10% of uh, all breach activities. Uh, system glitch and uh, uh, human error have dropped. Malicious and criminal attacks have risen by on the order of 10%. Uh, overall, per capita breaches have declined 27%, but the breach costs are staying the same. That means there's more attacks. It's becoming more and more common all the time. Now, this leads us to be able to say there are obvious financial advantages to continue building your security programs, detection and response capabilities, and overall maturity, um, which is something that a lot of people grapple with just how do I get engaged on my company's overall security maturity? We're going to help you with that uh, for free. In fact, we'll get to that here in a little bit. And resist having a prevention bias because, of course, we like to think that we're bulletproof and we can't be breached, but the fact is, is that everyone can be. So that's all about breach costs. Now let's talk about what do we do with our programs uh, in order to develop them and increase our maturity over time. We can, of course, do a SWOT analysis. And this is an example of what a typical company would be able to list as strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We have a great inventory of software and hardware. We know what we have. We know what their vulnerability levels are because we run scans on them once a month or once a quarter. Uh, we have uh, excellent reporting of our security status up to a board level. They're interested in it and they want to consume it. In fact, it's becoming more and more common for boards of directors um, to kind of cut a blank check to CISOs, uh, corporate information security officers, which actually results in the CISO bearing uh, more and more responsibility if and when a breach occurs. Uh, what are you talking about? We got breached. Didn't we give you all this money to help keep that from happening. It's not only about keeping it from happening. It's about limiting the costs when it does. Um, weaknesses would be a very long MTTI because we're not doing enough uh, monitoring and detection. Uh, changes to the environment are not automatically detected. Perhaps we don't have change management as a program within our environment at all. And so uh, we made a change, but it broke things, and we didn't realize that it did until we had, it had cost us $100,000. I have seen exactly that scenario play out over and over. Um, so opportunities would be things like the board has mandated security improvements and they're willing to fund it. Budget is established on these requirements and ROI uh, is to be calculated for all security analytics. And now this, um, this may pose a challenge to you. Consult with Cypher on these. We can help you establish what ROI of security initiatives is. Uh, threats would be phishing. Phishing is the most common attack vector. Uh, exposed Windows services, is huge. Uh, any security guy will tell you, do not put a Windows machine uh, facing the internet to where it can be reached by the internet at large. Um, it's just a really, really bad idea. Uh, failure, to, it's not that Windows systems can't be hardened, it's just most often they are not. Um, failure to comply with acceptable use policy is also a threat. 
even though acceptable use may say um, don't use BitTorrents to trade files um, and don't use corporate equipment to surf adult entertainment. Um, people might do it anyway, and this is a great way to gain malware. The malware is most typically a Trojan horse that uh, poses a back door for download of yet more malware to do targeted attacks on your environment. And lack of adequate training. People may not know what the security policy or acceptable use policy is, uh, and as we talked about just a minute ago, uh, phishing simulation training is a very, very good idea. So how do we go about starting to form a security program in our environment? Um, what we want to do is uh, get organized in our approach to just figuring out what our risk is. What is at risk? What are our crown jewels? What are we seeking to protect? And what are we seeking to prevent? Um, some things that we would uh, be interested in would be program and project delivery. Uh, certainly the company has projects that are underway, they're being worked on, we want to deliver them because then we can realize revenue from them. We want to protect those activities. Uh, likewise, operations and service delivery, if you're providing a service, we want those services to remain available. We want the information to remain confidential. We want the information that everyone is consulting to have integrity, to have it be what they think it's going to be. And we want to be able to run a cost-benefit impact for everything we do to uh, determine what categories of risk deserve how much attention. Uh, and then further define the risk scenarios. General descriptions of threat uh, vectors would be things like data theft or malware or acts of nature. If there's an earthquake that makes all the roads impassable and nobody can get there, do you have enough remote facilities for people to continue to work? And then identify risk events per scenario and category. What is infiltration? What is exfiltration, data going out? Uh, what are malware infections <clears throat> and how are they impacting these activities? Are we incurring equipment loss, theft of hardware, data loss, theft of information, or operational loss, uh, loss of the ability to be able to conduct our business? And how much would compliance failures play into all of those? Now, this next slide is an example of a tool that is available from a company called Infotech. Infotech, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Infotech because what they do is they provide an awful lot of tools uh, that allow you to work through these kinds of uh, conundrums and, and issues uh, and organize everything in an understandable way so that you can qualify what all of these things are. And what this slide represents is a risk register of a hypothetical business. <clears throat> In fact, it's not that hypothetical. This is one that I ran on a, a software manufacturing company for whom I used to be CISO. Um, so I would take part in these things. And in fact, I'm such a fan of Infotech that I have made tools of my own that are much like these. You fill in some blanks and the rest of the tool lights up with results. That is what our security maturity self-survey will do for you too. And uh, again, we'll offer that uh, for free uh, at the end of this presentation. Organizing programs in order to be able to handle all of the different activities that your risk register would indicate are necessary is uh, represented by this slide. Uh, user awareness and training is a program. Access control is a, a program. Least permissions is a a tenant of cybersecurity, if, if they don't need access to it, let's not give it to them. Uh, Anti-malware and data loss protection can be a program, along with all of these others. And you'll notice in the middle of the slide, um, I have called out some particular things. Applications, data, and infrastructure intersect with compliance and continuity. 
Now, this is just an example of the kind of categorization you may wish to do in your environment. In fact, applications, data, and infrastructure are very common. People like to intersect those with people, process, and technology, of course. In this particular case, my interest at the software manufacturing company was compliance and continuity. Those were my biggest risks in terms of cost. <clears throat> now, something I discovered uh, through personal experience was that the way these programs launch and operate the best is to pull people's expertise from across your company um, into the mix. Uh, for instance, user awareness and training is often uh, something that is best handled by HR. How about if we get the VP of HR involved to be a corporate sponsor for our user awareness and training program? Um, legal would be a good one for access control. CFO and accounting would be good for anti-malware and DLP. Marketing would be good for network and infrastructure security, and the customer service organization would be best for disaster recovery because they probably are dealing with these kinds of activities with your client base already. R&D would be good for incident response and uh, GRC, that's governance, risk, and compliance. That can be talking about uh, overall adherence to your security and acceptable use policies. It may also be about regulatory requirements like HIPAA or PCI or GDPR. And uh, for physical security, facilities is a natural outgrowth. These are departments that would benefit the most from exposure to security aspects such as these, or they already have expertise that lends itself to those activities. And the more you involve all the other departments in your company in devising security programs, the more buy-in for them that you'll have. Um, they'll actually come to think that they are impacting positively the security posture of your company, and they will be. Uh, having that kind of participation and buy-in is a really, really great thing to have. And so uh, coming up with programs such as these, having program charters for each, um, it may vary for your company. Your mileage may vary. There may be other activities that your threat landscape would dictate that you need to pay more attention to than these. Um, Focus your attention on those, for sure. So here are some truisms. It's often said that the cornerstone of every security program should be training and awareness, and that's true. Your frontline defense are your employees, uh, being aware that a phishing attempt is what it is, um, not letting people tailgate behind them through a, a badge access door, so on and so forth. Uh, your user's security awareness plays a critical role. Understanding the changing cyber attack landscape as it pertains to your business is uh, a critical, um, critically important ingredient. Fortifying your cybersecurity defense with systems hardening, sound access controls, endpoint protection, preventative measures, yes, absolutely, but uh, evaluate your security budget against your threat landscape and levels and don't leave out detection and response. Now, something that is the result of the uh, self-survey <clears throat> self that we're going to give you for security maturity uh, it looks like this. Uh, we have five different domains similar to NIST, govern, identify, protect, detect, and respond. Each of these would have a heat map of sub-items underneath of it. And um, uh, once you complete our survey, <coughs> and it's very easy to complete. You don't have to be uh, very technical to do it. It should take about an hour of your effort in order to come up with the results of this, which can be organized in a PowerPoint slide like this or using the graphics that are included in the tool itself. Now, Cypher uh, concentrates on security program development using uh, ideas just like all of these. Uh, we come up with customized management of your security service needs. Uh, management of your security assets like firewalls, IPS, DLP, and point protection management consoles. 
of vulnerability and compliance management. Excuse me one moment. I must have been talking for an hour. <clears throat> vulnerability and compliance management and more. <clears throat> now, something else, one moment. Something else that we can help you with in uh, <clears throat> forming and growing your security program are virtual CISO services that we can provide for you. Now, this can be on an ongoing basis. This can be in the form of a workshop. Um, either way, we would love to talk to you about that. And so, contact Cypher for all of those kinds of needs. Now, thanks very much. <clears throat> I do appreciate I apologize for my voice giving out on me, but thanks very much <clears throat> for your attendance. Uh, visit Cypher at www.cypher.com and download the tool. In fact, this is a clickable link. Click on it now and download it immediately. <clears throat> and Janine, this brings us up to our Q&A, our Q&A uh, section of the presentation. Thank you, David. Um, and while David takes a moment there, uh, hopefully he's on mute, clearing his throat, getting a drink of water. Um, as David mentioned, this is a live link. So it will open in a separate window um, to the free security self-assessment, and that way it'll be available to you following the webinar. So, David, if you're ready, let's kick off the Q&A. First question, right. what's the most important thing I can do to secure my business? The most important thing. If it seems a mystery to you, at the beginning, then contact an MSSP like Cypher to consult with you. And what we'll want to do are things that are very much along the lines of our self-assessment survey, which of course you can get here for free. Uh, you can share that with us if you would like or not. Um, for a lot of our clients, our GRC consulting clients, we run a full-on NIST <clears throat> assessment of their environment, their business processes and so on and so forth. Uh, that would be the good first step. It, first of all, is to get a good picture of what your current landscape is. Uh, what is the status of your current cybersecurity maturity? Next one up here, it says, how can we protect against supply chain attacks? Well, now, <clears throat> it actually was a supply chain uh, software manufacturer that I used to work for. I was their CISO for a long time. Uh, protecting against supply chain attacks is many faceted, okay? <clears throat> Some of the biggest risks that supply chain incurs is through third party vendors. Uh, we saw it happen with uh, retailers to where their HVAC vendors were the avenue in. And from there, they could uh, compromise their point of sale systems. Um, Supply chain itself is considered a, a critical infrastructure. And so following cybersecurity best practice uh, for all of the things that uh, Cypher would recommend is the best way to protect against supply chain attacks as in any attack. <clears throat> Let's see, I see here also, how do we get in touch with Cypher to have an evaluation done? Go to our site. Uh, the guy who's going to respond to the chat that is there is Bill de Blasio. Not Bill de Blasio. It's going to be uh, uh, Bill Bowman. Bill Bowman. Uh, Bill de Blasio will be the guy that Bill gets in touch with. He's our Northeast sales director. He'll be in touch with you promptly. Thanks, David. And then just um, this one. Would you recommend that we hire a person to help with cybersecurity and do it on our own? or work with an outside company? How do we decide? Well, the, my first answer is yes. <clears throat> you want to have somebody on your staff that is focused on, if not devoted to cybersecurity, but when you start to staff up um, to be able to do things like 24 monitoring and escalations, you'll find, and we have found through research, that the cost of that varies by geo. For instance, <clears throat> For instance, an average analyst cost in New York City 
is around one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year in Miami. It's more like seventy five thousand dollars a year. It's going to take at least six people uh, in a small company to be able to cover 24 by 7 shift work. And so we can multiply that and we can add to it lease space and equipment for them and training for them and so on. Uh, when you compare those kinds of costs with simply hiring an MSSP like Cypher, uh, the choice is clear. Uh, our expertise is already there. Great. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more questions, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and I especially want to thank Bill and David uh, for sharing their expertise with us today. Later this week, watch for a follow-up email. It will contain a link to the recording of today's webinar. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again. Have a great day, and stay well.